Hi, it's Dwyer, July 4th, 2021. Happy Independence Day, everyone, uh, especially in the USA. <laughs> um, let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me digress a little bit. You should have a few extra dollars in your pocket. Congratulations to the Milwaukee Bucks. More importantly, they delivered for us. Milwaukee and six got you great odds. Now let's talk about the situation in boxing right now. Some stories, we're gonna be informal here. Some stories that I think you should pay attention to. First, let's briefly talk about the Nakatani Lomachenko fight. That's a very important fight, understand. Nakatani had the advantage in power. Very heavy hitter. Nakatani had the size advantage. Very long arms. Nakatani also loops his punches. So you thought that Loma, if he started to go backwards, could have problems defending himself on punches where you're not quite sure where they're gonna land. But what we learned, and it's very important, in fact, it's on display here throughout the fight, is that Lomachenko has one of boxing's best inside games. During this fight, it became apparent that Nakatani could not fight inside. Nakatani needed to extend his arms to land shots, and Lomachenko using great feet. Right? Lomachenko can move places faster than others. And using great timing, continually crashed the pocket and continually roughed up Nakatani inside. Now it's important, Loma gets the KO, right? Knocks down Nakatani twice in the fight. But it's important because Teofimo Lopez is supposed to fight Nakata excuse me, supposed to fight Lomachenko in a rematch after his next fight, right? Now, as I've said here before, if you can get Lopez on his back foot, and keep in mind, Lopez had a lot more trouble with Nakatani than Lomachenko did. If you can get Lopez on his back foot, he's not the same fighter. In other words, this is a pot shotter. This is a counter puncher who needs to be alpha in the ring. If you take away the alpha status from him, he cannot win rounds as a beta. In other words, Lopez needs to dictate the action. If you don't allow him to, right? In the Nakatani fight, forget the scorecards, that was a close fight. I would say that's the toughest fight Lopez has had to date as a professional. In the Nakatani fight, Nakatani kept throwing volume at Lopez. Was too far outside for Lopez to pot shot him. Lopez often found himself getting hit with hard shots at distance. He wasn't able to impose himself on Nakatani. Now the judges saw a different fight than I did. I thought the Nakatani fight was razor close. Well, if you look at the last few rounds, Loma gives away the first half of the fight, but if you look at the last few rounds of Lomachenko against Lopez, Loma gets Lopez to back up. Folks, those are Loma's best moments of that fight. His best. And so, I'm looking forward to the Lopez-Lomachenko rematch, right? I believe it's going to be one of the few times in my life that I'm going to get an opportunity to take Lomachenko in a fight and to get plus 150 or better odds. Understand why the plus 150 is important. That will tell you that the market is only giving Lomachenko a 40% chance of winning that fight. Just ask yourself, who was getting the better of it late in their first fight? Who's the person who's most likely to have cracked the other guy's code? Now, don't get me wrong. Lopez won that fight on my scorecard. Lopez is a real champion. 
But boxing's not only about a fighter's strengths. It's also about a fighter's weaknesses. I want people to look hard at Lopez and look hard at Lomachenko. The point I'm making here is the holes in Lomachenko's game, right? Lack of heavy power, right? The holes in Lomachenko's game are minor compared to the possible major hole in Lopez's game if you can get him to back up. I think Lopez is making one of the biggest mistakes a fighter can make. Right? Believing that the rematch is going to be the same as the first fight. Let's remember, Loma gets surgery after the first fight. In other words, Loma wasn't healthy Loma that first fight. Right? I get the idea that Lopez doesn't want to fight Devin Haney. Let's get real here. Because that would be a unification match. Why are we hearing about other names and not the other champion? It's because... Somebody doesn't want that fight, and I believe it's Lopez. Because he doesn't want to chase Devin Haney. There is a possibility that Devin Haney, with his movement, with his spectacular legs, might be able to stay outside. Lopez doesn't want another Nakatani fight that goes the distance, only this time the judges might favor the fighter with the better movement. Right? He doesn't want that. He wants a guy who he thinks he's already beaten and who he'll always have an edge on. I think he's making a mistake. He should look at the Nakatani fight. He fought Nakatani. He knows how hard Nakatani is to beat. And folks, I'm just telling you, if you see Loma inside against Nakatani, we don't think of Loma like we think of Roberto Duran. Maybe we need to start changing that. He's elite inside. Elite. Let's shift gears. You know, I'm absolutely astonished as someone who makes predictions here online on fights that Roy Jones felt a need to comment on Errol Spence's comments that Jones is biased against him. Hey, all I could say is, look, this is zero sum. I want to hear Jones's opinion, right? Who's going to win the fight? If Roy Jones doesn't believe it's Errol Spence, then that's what I want to hear. I am shocked that an all-time great, and that's who Roy Jones is, let's remember, right? You know, you know Errol Spence is the man at 147, uh, one of them, right? Jones has upset Errol Spence by saying he believes Terrence Crawford beats him. Let, let me raise my hand here. I believe Terrence Crawford beats Errol Spence. Let me go further. I believe Manny Pacquiao beats Errol Spence. 42-year-old Manny Pacquiao. Right, let's make another comment that needs to be made. I understand that, you know, there's a lot of money to be made fighting in-house. Right, I get the idea that Manny Pacquiao is with Al Heyman. Right, at least for now. I understand there's a three-plus million dollar lawsuit out there from a group that claims that Manny's going to breach his contract if he proceeds with the fight against Errol Spence. But my point to you is if you're Errol Spence and if you want to prove to all of us that you're the best at 147 pounds, why wouldn't you fight Terrence Crawford? Don't you know about Terrence Crawford? Hasn't Terrence Crawford been in the public light long enough for you to realize that's the man you need to fight? No, I'm not going to knock him. He's taken on Manny Pacquiao, who is clearly the definition of a first ballot Hall of Famer, right? And I believe he doesn't know what he's in for. I think he thinks he's going to be able to push Manny around the ring like Jeff Horn did. Folks, that's a one-off fight. That's a one-off fight, right? I think Errol thinks, too, that, oh, Manny against a lefty, this is going to create problems for Manny. If I recall... Didn't Manny destroy David Diaz? Wasn't he a lefty years ago? Well, my point to you is this. Roy Jones was at one point the man at heavyweight. 
<laughs> Roy Jones is multi-divisional. Right? I don't believe guys who make or who have opinions on fights owe anybody an apology. Maybe maybe feelings get hurt when you say, look, I think this fighter is going to lose. Right? What do you want Roy Jones to do? Do you want Roy Jones to lie to you or do you want to hear the truth? I applaud Roy Jones. Right? Roy Jones basically saying, look, I, I think Terrence Crawford would beat Errol Spence. If Spence wants to take it personally, who cares? Not me. Let's continue. Years ago, I noticed that the cruiserweight division was spectacular. Not good. Spectacular. And at the time, I made videos, Google them. Google Dwyer cruiserweight division, coming invasion of the heavyweight division. And I talked about how I thought some cruisers were going to invade the heavyweight division. Well, right now you have Alexander Usyk about to fight Anthony Joshua. Let's be clear here. I like Usyk in that fight. You also have Maris Bredis now announcing that he's going to continue his trade <laughs> at heavyweight. Folks, he's one of the reigning cruiserweight champions, right? There's a distinct possibility. And understand, he's only lost once, and that's to Usyk, right? There's a distinct possibility that the toughest fight out there right now for Usyk is Maris Bredis. Right? Bredis thinks he did some things wrong in the first fight. The first fight was close. Bredis wants the rematch. Let me point out, too, that Murat Gassiev is now at heavyweight. Folks, you're going to have a changing of the guard coming within the next two years. Just like you go to a museum and they tell you, hey, here's the dinosaur section and you're looking at, you know, all these skeletons and all these paintings, and you're thinking to yourself, man, these dinosaurs were big, weren't they? Then you realize they no longer rule the roost. That dinosaur period was just one period of time. Right? Well, let's get real here. You know, we're in an era where you got guys 6'5", 6'6", 6'9", and they're the heavyweight champ. Right? You watch some of the fights, the guy's low volume doesn't really show you a lot of boxing ability. Whatever the judges are putting on their scorecard, right? The guy's not a master boxer. It's feast or famine. It's KO or he's losing several rounds. And then you realize, you know, this guy was once the heavyweight champion for a five-year period of time. Right? You look at another guy... And, you know, here he is fighting a former heavyweight champion who's been out of the ring for more than a year. He gets decked in the fight, looks finished, <laughs> has to get off the canvas, has to get off the canvas, gather his thoughts. So then you think to yourself, look, even great heavyweights have been dropped, right? Sonny Banks drops Ali. Henry Cooper drops Ali. Right, this must be a one-off fluke occurrence. Then, of course, you see the guy in against Andy Ruiz, and he's getting very accustomed to getting dropped. Right, in that fight, he's dropped multiple times. Right, you you look at the hand speed, and you're thinking, wow, you know, his hand speed, he's an accurate puncher, but the hand speed isn't blinding hand speed. Then, in terms of him pushing fights. You don't exactly feel like you're watching a Lennox Lewis. I'm just keeping it 100, folks. Well, my point to you is simply this. The premise that size matters most, that seems to have crept into the heavyweight division in recent years, and make no mistake, Lennox Lewis was viewed as a big heavyweight. Vitaly and Vladimir Klitschko were viewed as big heavyweights. 
right? Deontay Wilder, tall heavyweight by historical standards. Joshua and Tyson Fury, big heavyweights by historical standards, right? Is the premise that size matters most and that power is the trump card, is that going to be proven right? Or are we going to get back to the idea that speed and agility and timing and movement matter most in the heavyweight division? We're about to find out, folks, because the cruisers have gained weight. They understand that if you look back through history, you're going to have many heavyweights. Some of the biggest punchers in, in heavyweight history, Rocky Marciano, for example, who came into fights weighing less than some of the guys out there now. Right? You're going to find out that in history you've had some smaller heavyweight champions with huge punches. Mike Tyson. Right? And you've also had guys move up to become heavyweight champion. Let's remember David Hay was a cruiserweight. Let's remember Michael Spinks was a light heavyweight. Right? So, in my opinion, and it's July 4th, 2021, the next 18 months are going to be dazzling in boxing. Right? There's a movement toward consolidation of the titles in the heavyweight division. Quite frankly, you have too many big fights right now. Actual fights that are signed. The Canelo Caleb Plant fight is one of the biggest fights of this era. Right? Understand, Canelo right now is one of the biggest names in the sport. He's either going to be undisputed at 168 or the public is going to start to look at one of the best movers in the sport, some of the best footwork in the sport, in Caleb Plant. Right? Understand, the Jamal Charlo, Brian Castano fight is huge. Castano has wanted to fight Charlo for years. Castano is going to be constantly trying to track down Charlo in the ring. There are very few who can play the ambush game of being outside, then jumping in with a power hook, then going back out. Like Jamel Charlo can. The winner will be undisputed at 154. With serious young competition, some of the best in the sport. Erickson Lubin and I believe Virgil Ortiz, who's going to move up to 154, right? And if, if Gervonta Davis decides that he wants to fight not just a guy with a minor belt at 140, but a guy who's undisputed at 140, there are many of us who want to know, well, how good is Gervonta Davis really at 140? Let's revisit that Barrios fight. Floyd Mayweather is ringside. He gets a report that on the telecast, the guy scoring the fight on the telecast had Mario Barrios ahead. Folks, this is in the second half of the fight. And Mayweather, who was at the fight, understood with his own two eyes that that was a distinct possibility, right? If the, if the on-TV score was a complete loon, Mayweather could have just laughed it off. Instead, Mayweather felt the need to yell at his fighter. You know, you're losing the fight. You know, you pay me to tell you the truth. <laughs> I'm telling you, they have you behind. Now, can... Gervonta Davis, go from that to beating the undisputed at 140, Josh Taylor. Folks, that's, that's an open question, isn't it?
That is an open question. Let me also say this too, and I don't say lightly. One of the best left hooks in boxing, one of the best left hooks in boxing, belongs to a future Hall of Famer who's still fighting, who still insists on fighting the best. And that is Nonito Denaire. Now, Denaire has a stone in his shoe. There's something that bothers him. He fought the man they call Monster, in a way, and he lost that fight. It was a spirited fight, right? I can't say he was robbed, although it was close. He gets dropped in the fight off a body shot. It's masterful, but Denier feels he could have done better. Understand, Denier could leave the sport today. I believe he's a Hall of Famer. But you understand that these fighters, what makes them great is that drive, that need to know. Denier needs to know. So he wants another fight with Inoue. I'm just telling you, if those two guys fight a second time, I'm expecting a fight as historical as their first fight, right? So. As I like to say, there's always the guy in the bar who says boxing's not what it used to be, right? Just understand that that guy needs an Uber or a Lyft home because that guy is not operating in the real world. In the real world, you have a cruiserweight invasion of a heavyweight division. You have Lomachenko sharpening his inside game, ready for a rematch against Teofimo Lopez. You have Canelo not content being one of the biggest names in the sport, not content with all the money he's made. He needs to know, am I the best at 168 pounds? And he's about to take on a guy who, quite frankly, has exactly the fight style to give him problems. Is a better mover than Canelo, right? Great footwork. Let's remember, Kovalev, with footwork he's working on, <laughs> made it into the 10th or 11th round against Canelo. What happens if unbeaten? That's who he is, unbeaten. Caleb Plant is ahead of Canelo in the later rounds. Will it be enough for someone from Canelo's corner to tell him, hey, champ, on TV they're saying you're losing this fight. You need to do something. And of course, finally, Nanito Denaire, I think we need to shine a light on him, right? This is a guy who beat Vic Darchinian back in the day when we thought Vic Dar Darchinian was the man, right? Nanito Denaire still at it. The left hook is still spectacular. Understand, power is the last to go. Understand, experience builds knowledge. Right, Nanito Denaire might not be as fast as he once was, but he's cagey. He was an underdog in his last fight. He won that fight by stoppage. Right, keep an eye on Denaire in a way. If they sign to make that fight happen, in my opinion, that's a high priority. Give it your attention matchup. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. And look, I know I sound hard in talking about Errol Spence. I think Errol Spence is tremendous, right? I do. But this is the deep part of the pool. If we're talking about Terrence Crawford, yeah, there are going to be some people out there, Roy Jones, me, who feel that Crawford brings too much to the table, right? I know Crawford can fight left-handed. I've watched Crawford fights where I'm thinking, what the hell is... Is Terrence Crawford doing? And then I see the other guy fall down. Right? Let's remember, Crawford is fighting one of the fastest handed guys in the sport, Kel Brook. And Crawford comes out two rounds in and decides to switch hands. Folks, it's on film. Gets the stoppage on Kel Brook. Right? So I don't think, you know, I get heat here online. There are supporters of many fighters who feel that I'm being unfair and stuff like that. Look, I'm not going to say 
that I don't get some fights wrong. We all do, right? Sports betting involves uncertainty, right? If you're looking for certainty, you're looking in the wrong place. We'll all get fights wrong. But you know what? Let's applaud guys for telling the truth. Roy Jones doesn't think that Errol Spence beats Terence Crawford. He's telling you his truth. For that, he owes no one an apology. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.